Amen. Go ahead, take your seats. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Josh. Great to have you with us. First time guests and visitors on behalf of the staff and leadership. Um, you're an answer to prayer. Big warm welcome. Um, glad to have you here with us. It's good to be back together uh, just as a community after the events of the last few weeks under um, better terms, better conditions than last weekend. Um, yeah, really encouraging to be able to look out and see you all here. We typically open our gathering by reading through a section of scripture. If you've been here, you know this. this we do this because this is um, the practice from the church. It has been the practice of the church from the beginning, and not the beginning of praxis nearly two years ago. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking like 2,000 years ago in the church. This has been a practice since then, and we know this because um, the Apostle Paul said to the young evangelist Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, he said, Devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to teaching, and to exhortation. So we know from the very beginning, the church would gather, they would read scripture. And they would do that because this is the engine of the church. This is the power center of the church. This is what's transformed our lives. The word of the Lord coming alive by the, the Spirit's power in our hearts and minds. We read this every week because you don't need to hear from me. I am a most fallible man. I mean that. I am a man most fallible. But this is a word that is infallible. It, it is true. And so this is why we read it every week. Now, with that said, this morning we're working through the largest section of text we've ever worked through and that I've ever preached through. It's huge. And just because I want to get us out of here before dinner today, what we're going to do is I'm going to read a bit, I'm going to preach a bit, read, preach, kind of that style. And we've done that a few different times, but um, just wanted to give you a heads up. Um, this is a long section. It's going to require some grace. So I need you to get your Bibles open. Genesis 30, I'll pray, and we will dive into this really long but really good section of text. Um, Lord, I thank you after the events of the last few weeks and um, so much that's been filling our minds, that's been worrying us, um, that we can come back and we can fix our eyes back on that sure and certain hope that we have held secure in heaven for us, regardless of what comes. We know that that can't be shaken, that can't be taken. And so we rejoice and, and pray that your son would have been made much of through that as we've gathered to, to sing praises to his name and, and, and praise back to you, Father, for sending your son in your pursuit of us. And now as we open your word, which you've spoken by the power of the spirit, you've preserved through the spirit, that as we open it, I, I ask for your empowerment just to be able to present what's here, that we would see why this section of text was preserved for us. And so, Holy Spirit, come and do your work. I'm dependent on you, and I ask in your great name all these things. Jesus, amen. All right. Well, before we dive in, it's been a couple of weeks since we were in Genesis. Some of you, you're just, this is your first time here. You don't know where we've been. So I'm going to do a little bit of a refresher on where we've been in Genesis. For the last while, we've been looking at the descendants of Abraham. And, you know, Abraham, Abraham had a son named Isaac. Um, Isaac had twin boys, Jacob and Esau. We've been looking at them for the last little while. You know, this, this one son, Jacob, was a bit of a trickster, and it, his name actually kind of reflects that and means that. But at one point, him and his mom band together. They decide they're going to steal the blessing from the slightly older twin brother, Esau, and, and this family erupts into some turmoil. It's messy. So Jacob ends up fleeing the family unit and fleeing the promised land for fear of his hairy brother Esau coming after him. So he flees the land, and he ends up working for his trickster uncle Laban for seven years. Seven years of work to marry Rachel. He thought she was really good-looking. He wanted to marry really good-looking Rachel, but on the wedding night, he found out he's married the not-so-good-looking Leah with weak eyes. And so he ends up coming out of the tent in the following morning and realize he's been tricked into marrying a different woman. So then he, he negotiates a deal whereby Laban would give him Rachel right away and he would work for seven more years. That's kind of where we left off. Now we're, or actually where we left off in the other week was they started to have babies. Um, at first, Jacob has some babies with Leah. Then um, Rachel can't get pregnant. So Rachel um, gives her servant to her husband and, and he willingly obliges and has some babies with Rachel's servant. Then Leah goes, well, I can give you my servant too. And so she gives her servant 
to Jacob, who he has babies with. And then eventually at the end, Rachel gets to have one of her own um, named Joseph. And in the end, they come out with 12 babies, 12 babies between two baby mamas and two wives. And what this means when you have 12 children is that you're going to drive a, a, a 18 passenger van. You're going to have to park at the, the far side of the Costco parking lot. We've all seen that. And that there's going to be some really awkward combos as your kids bring friends over. Like, hey, here's, here's my half-brother, Dan, who my dad had with our servant, Milha. Hi, Milha. How are you today? Um, this is my brother, cousin, Joseph. And this is my full brother, Ruben, who makes a great sandwich. It's a messy family, a big, messy family. And this is what we keep seeing over and over and over in Genesis. God doesn't choose people who have all their poop in a pile. He chooses messy people, amen? Look around. You're messy looking people from up here. We're messy people. Anyone here with your brother cousin? None today. Okay, good. So we've got, we're, we're a little better. We're, we're progressing as a society. Now, when we read all these stories in Genesis, we need to keep in mind that we're, these behaviors, these actions we're seeing, they're not being presented as things to copy. It's just recording what was going on. So this isn't prescribing a way of life, like, oh, hey, go marry four different women. What it's saying is, this is what's going on. It's not meant to put them forward as examples for us. It's meant to magnify the grace of God. So this is where we're picking up. We're going to pick up in verse 25. Rachel's just had Joseph, and it says this, as soon as she had borne him, Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I might go to my own home and country. Give me my wives, which anytime you have to pluralize that, you're in trouble, and give me my wives and my children for whom I've served you, that I might go, for you know the service that I have given you. Jacob had been in the promised land. He'd run away to his, his mother's ancestral homeland. Now, because of his shyster uncle Laban um, and his scheming and trickery against him, he decides he's going to go back to where he had been, the promised land that was the land that was promised to Abraham the land that was promised to Isaac, and actually just a chapter or two ago to him as well when he met God at Bethel. So he he says, I'm going to leave. But um, Laban, pardon me, says, if I have found favor in your sight, I've learned by divination the Lord's blessed me because of you. Name your wages and I'll give it. So now we learn something important about Laban here. Laban is not a worshiper of God. He's not. He's, He's a worshiper of other gods, and he's practicing divination. If you're like wondering what that is, that's kind of the, you know, um, seeking knowledge from spirits, from demons, things like this. It's a cultist practice, cultish practice. Think tarot cards, think cast in the chicken bones, pendulum swinging, autotomic kind of writing, tea leaves, feng shui, all of that business. He's consulting this stuff trying to get wisdom on how to, how to do his life. He, he consults, probably seeking a blessing, because Laban is just after money all the time. But as he does this, apparently, whatever he's communicating with says to him something along the lines of, hey, we're not the ones blessing you. You're blessed because of Jacob. And so somehow he comes to realize this, that it's Jacob bringing the blessing. And Actually, if we go back a few different chapters to 27, you'll remember when he tricked that blessing out of his dad wearing the hair suit, his dad blessed him, and the blessing he pronounced over him was that he would have fruitful flocks. So now that's happening. That's what's going on in Laban's land and with Jacob. Actually, and just a chapter ago, when God met him at Bethel, he promised him that he was going to do the same thing. And so this blessing is bearing itself out, um, and, and, and Laban wants him. He, he, he doesn't want to lose kind of the golden goose, so to speak. He, he wants this blessing that he's brought, and so he's trying to keep him. But... Actually, I think something much bigger is going on in this story. If you, two weeks ago, when Keith left off here, he mentioned how God's in the business of transforming people. Keith mentioned how every generation needs to have an encounter with the living God. We can't just be kind of coasting through with the faith of those who came before us. And this story here, it's, what it's going to do, it's, it's going to mark this, 
this transition where Jacob flees, but it's going to do something else. This is where Jacob's faith is going to start becoming his own. It's going to stop being something that he's inherited, and it's going to unpack, and it's going to transform his own life. And let me show you why I'm getting there, all right? So Laban comes, and, and he asks him not to leave. But listen to Jacob's response here in verse 29. He says to him, so Laban says, name your wages, I'll give it. In verse 29, Jacob says, you know, I've served you. You know how your livestock has fared with me. You had a little before I came, and then it's increased abundantly. The Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now, when shall I provide for my own house? So Laban said, what shall I give you? Jacob said this, you shall not give me anything. And it's important, Laban's not trying to bless Jacob. He, he's trying to get him indebted to him again. He's trying to keep his r- lucky rabbit's foot around so that he keeps getting blessed. Laban is a big old user. He's an exploiter. He's thinking about his bottom line, what will work to his advantage, and how he can advance himself. And Jacob recognizes this, and this is why he says, you shall give me nothing. Now, it, we shouldn't usually follow a lot of the examples of people in scriptures. These aren't like Aesop's fables that are giving us moralistic lessons, especially with the life of Jacob. But there is something Jacob does pretty decently here, a lesson we can learn. He, he doesn't fall into Laban's trap. And there's a trap. He recognizes it and he doesn't fall into it. Secondly, he doesn't take a handout. He works. This is an important lesson. Nothing's free. Nothing is free, especially when it comes from someone like Laban or the government. Never free, right? You, you either pay for it on the front end or you're going to pay for it on the back end for a long time. He's already had that happen with Rachel. He worked seven years, then he got the free thing, and then he was worked, actually, he spent 20 years working for Laban for nothing. Like, he's learning a lesson here. Things aren't free. And um, he's now learned this lesson, avoids another trap Laban has set because he remembers, actually, the promise that God has given him. If you take a look at this, Genesis 28, a little earlier, God had promised him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie. He's speaking this while he's back in the promised land before coming to Laban. The land you are on, I will give to you and your offspring. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and the north and the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I'm with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. Pay attention to that. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've done what I've promised. Instead here, of trusting Laban's promises. Actually, the way I would say he's able to not fall into the trap of Laban is he remembers the promise of God. He remembers what God's promised him, and he decides, I'm going to park on that. I'm going to trust that more than my schemes or my strategies or my own abilities. And this is why I say this is the turning point in in Jacob's faith journey. He decides to trust God rather than his schemes. And if you've been tracking with the story, Jacob's kind of a, a manipulative schemer in his own right. So God told me he'd bring him back. Now he's able to resist this trap of a handout from Laban. And what he does is he creates a contract. He actually comes to Laban. Instead of letting Laban write the terms, He comes with the terms. And take a look at verse 31. We'll see this. So he says, you shall give me nothing. Then he goes on. But if you will do this for me, I'll pasture your flock. Let me pass through all the flock, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and they will be my wages. So my honesty will answer me later. When you come to look into my wages with you, every one that's not speckled and spotted among the goats and among the lambs, if found with me, shall be counted stolen. So <clears throat> he's going to try the honesty gig. He's going to try just working for it. Um, he's going to 
He's not going to deceptively steal from Laban. He's going he's to create a contract. Now, sheep were normally solid colored. And so he says, I'll take the speckled. They're normally dark. He says, I'll take the light. Here's what he's looking for. I'll take the abnormal animals. And smarter people than me, they estimate this is about 20% of the flock at max. And so what Laban is getting here is the absolute deal of the century. Hey, I'll take care of all your crops. Continue to extend this blessing to you. I only need 20%. So Laban agrees to it. But then look at So Laban says, good, let it be as you said. But that day Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted. Everyone that had white on it, every lamb that was black, put them in the charge of his sons, set a distance of three days journey between himself and Jacob. And Jacob then went and pastured the flock. He steals what he had just agreed to give to Jacob. But It's kind of like Jacob had done with his brothers. You remember what he did to Esau? He deceptively stole what was rightfully his. Now here, Laban's doing the same thing to him. He's he's given a bit of a taste of his own medicine, so to speak. God here is, is using the deceptiveness of Laban, actually, to accomplish something in Jacob, I believe. It's no it's no mistake that we're seeing these correlations. Jacob is going to learn a lesson by way of another schemer now. And that's a bit, I think it's an important lesson, something for us, it's noteworthy anyway, that perhaps that annoying person we're dealing with, perhaps that situation we're facing, perhaps the Laban in our own life might not just be a pain in our posterior. Maybe Maybe they're actually there to accomplish something in us. Maybe they've been allowed by God to to make us trust him more. God here is going to use Laban's um, deception as a means for Jacob to learn to trust God. And isn't it ironic, don't you think, that God changes the deceptive tricker through another deceptive tricker? Sometimes God gives us a dose of our own medicine in order to treat the things in our heart that we're prone to trust that aren't him. And as we read on, um, well, th- it's a confusing section. I'll just, I'll say this on the upfront. So I'm gonna preface this by saying these following verses are, are a little weird, but I'll do my best to make sense of them. Take a look at verse 37. So this all happens. Laban steals the flock that belongs to Jacob, or he just promised him, puts three days between them. But Jacob took... Then, with what he was left, fresh sticks of poplar and almond and plane trees, and he peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the sticks. And he set the sticks that he'd peeled in front of the flocks in the troughs, that is, in the watering places when the flocks came to drink. And since they bred when they came to drink, the flocks would breed in front of the sticks. And so the flocks brought forth striped, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob separated the lambs, and he set the fair um, faces of the flocks towards the striped, and all the black in the flock of Laban. He put his own droves apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. Whenever the stronger flocks were breeding, Jacob would lay the sticks in the troughs before the eyes of the flock that they might breed among the sticks. But for the feebler, he would not lay them there. So the feebler would be Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Now, it's confusing. You're kind of like, what in the heck is going on here? This is a weird story, right? Um, Many think there's some sort of scientific thing going on, like if animals looked at these sticks, they would somehow take on the characteristics that were carved into the bark of the sticks. Um, But we know that's not how things work. Like, it's actually not how things work. Babies aren't born different colors because of what mom was looking at. We know that, right? Like, dads, that would never pass the sniff test. Like, why is my baby a different color? Oh, I was looking at this picture. It's not how things work. And when we read the Bible, sometimes we think, oh, I just got to turn my brain off and like forget all of reality that I know is true. No, you don't. You actually need to keep your brain turned on. And as we do, then we can actually interpret what's going on here. Because God knew, okay, so did the writers of the Bible. No one through forever has thought that that's going to work. I think that there's actually something we're being shown here. 
It's that when Jacob's plan goes sideways, he comes up with something else to trust before God. Before going to God and asking for help, hey, Laban just stole all the crops. He's like, well, I better come up with some sort of strategy and scheme that I can trust. And so he, he starts practicing some sort of weird animal breeding stick hoodoo. It, it's not good. Again, it's not prescribing. Like this isn't, if you're an animal farmer, this isn't going to work for you. This is Jacob grasping at straws. And, and actually, if we read on a little head in the story, we find out this is true. Flip a chapter to the right. So flip a page with me. We'll go on a journey to chapter 31, which we're going to come to in a bit, a um, little bit before dinner this afternoon. Um, chapter 31, verse 4, as Jacob is asking his or telling his wives his plan to flee. We're kind of dropping into the middle of that conversation, but there's something here I want us to see. Jacob called Rachel and Leah and said, hey, look at your father doesn't regard me, the God of my father that has been with me. You know, I served your father with all my strength, yet your father cheated me, changed my wages 10 times, but God didn't permit him to harm me. If he said, the spotted will be your wages, then all the flock would be spotted. If he said, the striped shall be your wages, then all the flock will be spared or would be spotted. Apparently, Laban's coming back later and changing all the terms on him again. But he says this, thus God has taken away all the livestock of your father and given them to me. Was it his crafty stick hoodoo? No, it was God that took it away. And listen to this. It says in verse 10, in the breeding season of the flock, I lifted my eyes up and saw in a dream that the goats that made it with the flock were striped, spotted, and um, mottled. Then the angel of God said to me in a dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift up your eyes and see All the goats that mate with the flocks are striped, spotted, and mottled, for I've seen what Laban is doing to you. So it wasn't Jacob's selective breeding plan or his stick breeding hoodoo that would cause him to be blessed. It was God. But he only learned that through having, you know, everything else, his schemes and strategies and Laban steal everything. It was only when he came to the end of himself, started making up some sort of weird breeding ritual that didn't work, that God came, spoke to him, and actually blessed the flock to multiply. It's only after he'd been stripped of everything that this made sense. And actually, one commentator I read this week, I, I found this quote, I love it. He said this, when Jacob agreed to continue serving Laban in exchange for the odd-colored animals of the flock, listen to this, God sovereignly overruled both the deceit of Laban and the devices of Jacob. God was, God was messing with both their plans. Why? In order to bless the patriarch, Jacob, in order to do something in him. So here's the question I have for us. Sometimes God's frustrating our business because he wants to do things in us, because he wants us to trust him. And so church, I want to ask us, what are we trusting in? What is it that we actually think is going to get us blessed? And if you don't know, sometimes those questions can be hard. If you reverse engineer the question, it can help us. So let me ask something different. When you look at other people who are blessed with the things that you want, Do you go, oh, that's because they're crafty. That's because their parents gave them a ton of cash. That's because they got lucky. That's because they're schemers. That's because they're thieves. Or do you go, or hard work. What is the thing that we think is blessing others? That's probably the thing that we're prone to trust in as well. But this is reminding us, it's none of those things. It's God is the one who blesses us. Proverbs says this, church, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Again, Psalm 20 says, some trust in chariots and horses. This is what some feel confident in. You know, we've got an army. I've got these things. No, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. That's where the people of God are to find their trust and their security and their hope of blessing. Finally, Jeremiah says this. Um, we, it records the Lord speaking this. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. Let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. 
That's the goal. That's what God's doing in Jacob. And sometimes God will allow our plans to be thwarted because he wants to accomplish something in us. This is the most important thing, that the principal place in our heart is him and that we trust him before any plan or scheme of our own. And God's blessing will come on God's people when we seek God's kingdom first. If it comes before that, that's not a blessing from God. That might be a distraction from Satan. Now, it's important to note, though, here that the blessing did come by way of work. So Jacob did work. He did take care of these, these goats and these sheep. But it came by way of working in a way that lined up with God's precepts and promises. And, and likewise, the Bible calls us to work as well. It's not just like sit still and get blessed. We're commanded to work. The Bible says if you don't work, you won't eat calls us to work. It actually calls us to work harder than anyone else. This is why there's terms like Protestant work ethic, because Protestants historically have worked hard. Why? Because we believe that when we do, God blesses us. We're to work according to to God's promises, and when we do, we believe that God blesses us. And so just another question, do we work like that? What's our hope in being blessed, and then do we work hard as, as unto the Lord? Colossians commands us to. It says, whatever we do, work heartily. As for the Lord, not for men, knowing that it's from the Lord you will receive an inheritance. Work, why? Because we are serving the Lord Christ. Jacob, I think, is learning this practically on the ground. His, he, he always has worked hard at scheming. He's always worked hard at tricking other people. Now he has to work hard simply trusting God. He had to give up his dumb stick idea. He had to give up his contract with Laban. He had to just work and trust God would bless him. And there's a lesson in that for us. We see Jacob leaves blessed when he does so. But then as God begins to bless him, we got to flip over to chapter 31. One, because, you know, I don't know if anyone brought a snack pack, but we're only halfway through our text And so I want to get you out of here before dinner. Um, God blesses Jacob, but then this irks Laban. Laban and his sons become jealous. Look at verse, or sorry, chapter 31, verse 1. It says, Jacob heard that the sons of Laban were saying, Jacob has taken all that was our father's, and from his father he gained all of our wealth. So one, they're still believing wrong. They think He's been blessed because of hard work, because of schemes, whatever it might be. He's blessed because God has blessed him. Laban, though, is angered. He's jealous. Why? Because he's greedy. We first came across this guy back in 24. He's no good. He's trouble. He's greedy. And you need to watch out for greedy people. Greedy people don't worship God. Greedy people worship gold. And greed and jealousy and all of this, greed is the worship song that worshipers of gold sing. They're after his stuff, and they'll stop at no lengths to get it. Greedy people will tell lies to to get what they want. We've seen that in Laban. He's done this. Greedy people will manipulate you in order to get something from you. We've, We've seen Laban do this. Greedy people will sabotage you in order to get what you have and they want. We've seen that. With Laban. Laban is jealous of Jacob's blessing. And this this is just a truth. Hey, sometimes people are going to become jealous of you and will oppose you because of God's blessing on you. As you work hard and trust God to provide, as he does, there is people who will turn on you. Why? Because you were getting the thing that they want. However, their religious devotion isn't giving them that thing. And so then they're angered because why are you getting that when I've been working my tail off to try to get that thing? And it's, you know, to quote Alanis Morissette again, isn't it ironic, don't you think, that when we seek after God first, these things come? But when we seek after these things, we don't get them. When God is in the ultimate place, the lesser things come. But when those lesser things take over the ultimate place, God loves, specifically in his children, 
loves to frustrate those plans because he wants the ultimate place in our heart. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then these things will be added to you because they can be in their right spot because they won't be objects of worship. This is the promise. Seek God. These other things will be added. Jesus said it. But it, there's also warning for those who spend their lives clamoring in greed after these other things. Scripture gives a warning. Ro- warning. Romans 2 says, God's going to repay each one according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance and doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he'll give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and reject the truth and follow wickedness, there will be wrath and anger. Laban here, we see, not a worshiper of God, he's a worshiper of gold. And while he's been craftily trying to get as much as he can, God's been blessing Jacob. God's been letting Jacob prosper in front of Laban. And I think it's God's grace in a sense. He's showing Laban the futility of his ways. Hey, that's not working for you. He hasn't came down and just like hit him with a lightning bolt. There's things in front of Laban that Laban's not paying attention to. God's showing him and by thwarting his plans how his pursuits are futile. He blesses Jacob and, and he tells him to leave town. And then it says this, the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your father's. Now, we already read the 10 verses that follow where Jacob goes and tells his wives and, um, and baby mamas why they should, he wants to leave town. We've read that. And so drop down with me to verse 14, and we'll continue on in the story here. After having done this and, and pleaded the, his case for why he wanted to leave, it says, Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, Is there any portion or inheritance left to us in our father's house? Are we not just regarded by him as foreigners? He sold us, and he's devoured our money. All the wealth God has taken away from our father belongs to us and our children, so we'll go wherever you go. They concur. Their father is a lying, cheating scoundrel. It's time for us to leave. Laban worships the God of money, and and so they see God as a better object of worship, and they, they head out to the land that God has promised them. It says, so Jacob arose and and set his sons and his wives on camels. He drove away all his livestock, all his property that he'd gained, everything God had blessed him with, the livestock and his possession that he'd acquired, and and he went to the land of Canaan to his father Isaac. Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and, and Rachel stole her father's household's gods. This is interesting. We'll come back to this in a sec. And Jacob tricked Laban the Aramean by not telling him that he intended to flee. He fled with all that he had, crossed the Euphrates, and set his face toward the hill country of of, of Gilead. So Jacob loads up the moving truck and moves while his in-laws are out of town. You know your family's dysfunctional when you're like, yeah, we're going to leave without you knowing. And like, I don't need your help moving. I don't even want you to know I'm moving. Some of us, we have people like this in our lives. Maybe it's your in-laws or your, your immediate family. There's probably someone, you know, a lying, cheating, deceiving, manipulative individual around you, a Laban. I want to say a few things. One, the gospel assures us anyone can change. The gospel can change anyone's heart. And we got to believe that. We got we to, anytime somebody comes to us repentant, rejoice over that because that's a sign the Holy Spirit's doing something in their heart. We should always seek to reconcile and repair relationships. We shouldn't be quick to abandon hope or give up on the idea of reconciliation. But Jacob here has been serving for Laban for 20 years. He's changed his wages multiple times. He's lied. He's cheated. Not once have we seen Laban say sorry. And there can come a time when we need to walk away. Pack up the van and don't tell them you're leaving. This is what Jacob does. Get verse 22. Once I find it. He was told, sorry, but yeah, so when it was told Laban on the third day what Jacob had done, he took his kinsmen with him, pursued him for seven days until they got close to him. But God came 
to Laban the Aramean in a dream and told him, be careful not to say anything to Jacob. So they take off. Laban's choked. His lucky rabbit's foot gone. Um, rabbit's foot is gone. He, he, he takes off after his, his son-in-law, probably with horrible intentions. But God shows up, stops him, tells him, don't do anything to him. And which is a good reminder. God's going to get in the way of those who oppose his people. Just whether in this life or the life to come, God opposes those who oppose his people. Um, he comes and again, graciously warns Laban, leave him alone. I'm with him. Don't go after him. But Laban does anyway. Take a look at what he does. So Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in, in the hill country. And so Laban came and did the same thing. Laban said, came and said to Jacob, what have you done? You've tricked me. You've driven away my daughters like captives of the sword. Why, didn't, why did you flee secretly and trick me and, and not tell me so that I might have sent you away with mirth and songs and tambourine and lyre? He's a liar. Here he's spinning the story. I'm a loving father-in-law. Why would you do this to me? I would have helped you move. I would have brought the pizza. But he's not a loving father-in-law. He's a conniving slave master. Laban is tricked and deceived. He's, he's doing whatever he wants to get what he wants. He doesn't care about his family at all. And he's coming and he's rewriting history. He's diminishing his own actions and majoring instead on the actions of Jacob. You did this. You did this. You did this. You did this. Not owning a single bit of his own stuff. Trying to spin the story that he just wants what's best for Jacob. And he accuses Jacob of trickery, when in fact, he's the one guilty of it. This is what people who don't worship God will often do. They'll come, they'll shift blame, they'll point out all the things they hate about you without acknowledging any of their own sinful actions. The deceptive scoundrels. Sometimes we need to flee. Sometimes it's the right time to flee. If people come repentant, if people want to reconcile rightly, we always need to forgive. Sometimes you need to flee. As whatever comes may, come what may, there is an important truth here, though, is that worshipers of God can trust that God is in control of all of these situations. We need to have that hope. People who don't worship God, they don't have that assurance, and that's why they act the way they do. We have the assurance that, hey, even if they kill us, even if they rob us, God's more in control than them. God is working this plan to accomplish something even greater. The God Laban worships money has been taken from him, and he's fighting tooth and nail. And actually, as we read on, there's, um, there's, some, there's a funny story here. I, I said we'll come back to his household gods being stolen. Take a look at verse 30 here. Um, he comes in hot pursuit of Jacob, and, and he says, why did you steal my gods? And so Jacob kind of works this, he, he, basically he, he says this, I have nothing of yours, go through all my stuff, take a look at it. If you find anything, it's yours. If you find someone in my house that's stolen your household gods, um, well, you know, you can, you can kill them. So Laban goes into Jacob's tent, and he didn't find anything. And he went out, a, he goes into Leah's tent, didn't find anything. Then he goes into Rachel's, verse 34. Rachel had taken the household gods, put them in a camel saddle, sat on them. Laban felt all about the tent, but didn't find them. And, and she said to her father, let my, not my Lord be angry. I can't rise from before you for the way of women is upon me. So she, she fakes having her period saying, I can't get up. But there's some interesting stuff here. There's lots. There's way more than we're going to be able to unpack. Two things to notice. Rachel, in stealing her father's gods, is renouncing them and defiling them. If your gods can be godnapped, they're not that good at gods, okay, for one. But secondly, there's, there's kind of a literary thing going on here where she fakes having her period and it is a way saying your gods are worth as much as a menstrual rag. And they are. Jacob is, or sorry, Laban is finding this out. The thing that he's worshipped to give him gold failed over and over, and now they can actually be stolen from him. 
So notice that. Second thing I want us to notice, verse 33, Laban um, describes everything that Jacob has as his. He's greedy. But in verse 9, Jacob says everything he has is God's. That's the difference. Sometimes God takes things that we think are ours so that we will learn to acknowledge where it's actually come from. And that's a gracious action. Sometimes God bankrupting you is a gracious action. It's teaching us where it all comes from. When we close our hands like this, just in filthy greed, trying to hold as much as we can, sometimes it just squeezes out of our fingers. And it's only when we come like this that God can fill our hands with more. It's an important lesson. God loves to teach his servants. So expect that one to come. Look forward to it. Laban doesn't worship God. Jacob was right to flee. And as we read these final verses, we're going to see a very important thing take place, um, one that's often misunderstood. I'll, I'll just read it, and then we'll kind of, I'll try to explain it. So they come together, and verse 44, they say, let us make a covenant, you and I, let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone, set it up, and made a pillar. And, and Jacob said to his kinsmen, uh, gather stones. So they took stones, made a heap, and there um, they ate by the heap. This is a covenant-making ceremony. We've talked about this before. Laban called it one thing. Jacob called it another. They're divided. These two names, they're just different terms, um, different languages. They called it by their own thing, but the one term for it was Mizpah. Mizpah. Anyone heard that term before? No one? Okay, wow. Um, this is a very misunderstood verse. So this, it says, they called it Mizpah for, uh, well, I lost it. He said, the Lord watch between you and me when we're out of one another's sight. Often we think of this term Mizpah, or it's taught that this, this word Mizpah means the Lord watch over us while we're apart. Like it's a term of endearment. It really isn't. It's not. My mom, when I went to college, she gave me a stone that said Mizpah. And, and it was like, would the Lord watch over us while we're apart? Actually, what this means is the Lord keep us apart. And so I've stopped visiting my mother. Um, no, read on. It, it's explained here. It says, Laban said to Jacob, see this heap and this pillar which I set between you and me? This is a heap of witness. The pillar's a witness. I will not pass over it to you. You don't pass over it to me. And the God of Abraham, keep us apart. They offered a sacrifice kind of as a way of saying, if you cross over, you're dead, like this animal. Sometimes, there's just there's so much going on in this story. I'm trying to figure out how to pull this all together. Sometimes it, we're right to separate. God, of course, can change hearts. Sometimes we're very right to separate. And this is one long story. I mean, we could have broken this up and done it in a couple of weeks, but I think that all together, when we look at this whole, this story is telling us a few important things. The very first is this, kind of practical lesson. We can trust in God's promises. This text proving it, okay? If you've been with us, back in chapter 12, God made a promise to Abraham. Then he came along, he, he, he doubled down, told Abraham it again. Then he extended it to Isaac. He's extended it to Jacob and the, as we go on, what we're seeing is that these promises came true. God's faithful to fulfill his promises. He's told him, I'll bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. This story shows us this. He's blessed. Laban was blessed because Jacob was there. God's promises are being shown true. God has went on to say he was going to bless all the nations through Jacob. And on this side of history, we know he did because through Jacob and Leah came Jesus, the one who would forgive the sins of the, the entire world. God's promises are sure and true. He, he sent the Savior as promised. He's given us all sorts of promises as well, this promise that he would begin a work in us and finish a work in us. He's given us a promise that you know, we would have abundant life. 
in Christ. He's given us a promise that we would have eternal life. He's given us a promise that just as Christ died and came back from death, that when we die, we will resurrect to eternal life as well. He's given us a promise that he'll return one day. God's made lots of promises. This is a great reminder that they're true. All of them we're seeing in the story of Genesis are coming true. We can trust in his promises. Secondly, we can rely on his protection. In the face of Laban, the manipulative huckster, who's trying to outmaneuver Jacob, who's cheated and lied, God comes and runs interference like a linebacker. God's working to protect Jacob. He actually comes to Laban in a dream and says, back off. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. We're being shown God's a faithful protector and those who are his, we don't need to worry whatever we might be facing. Why? Because God's in our corner. Isaiah says, no weapon fashioned against us will prosper. It shall not succeed. Why? God's our defender. We can trust in his promises. We can trust in his protection. Here's the third thing that I really think kind of this, this... this text is presenting to us is that we can hope in God's providence. Some small details often seem small in the moment, but God is, the scripture tells us, working things together to accomplish his larger narrative. And sometimes in the moment, we can kind of get blinded by what's going on around us. And if we had that 10,000 foot view, we would see what God's actually up to. I'll give you an example. There is um, the uh, Cradle Creek. Is that what it's called? Crater Creek. Wildfire in Carameas. Um, My mom, um, I was joking. I still talk with her. She was about to be evicted by this. So I've been tracking this fire for the last few weeks. Much larger than the one we had up here. And um, at one point, there's this man. I found this story. This man, he's on a 21-day hike through the Cathedral Mountains. There's a long solo hike. And the fire comes down the sides of the mountain and actually traps him. He had a GPS phone, and so he he calls out for help. But because of the fires, no one could get in to rescue him. And then at one point, like this, this object falls. I think it was a rock with a note wrapped on it. And the note tells him, head up this direction. It gives him a course. And, and he's like, he's surrounded by fire. So he's literally walking up this ridge that he, he thinks he's just going to burn alive. He gets three quarters of the way up the ridge and these guys run out, grab him and pull him onto a helicopter. Why I bring this story up is that um, this helicopter was able to see a perspective on this situation that could save this man whereby he could get out. Similarly, God has a perspective that we sometimes don't have on our situations. We can feel surrounded we can feel like all there is is opposition and this and that. This story reminds us, it pulls us up to that 10,000 foot view where we can look down and we get to see how God is working all of these things together to accomplish his promises. God is providentially working and Romans tells us this. It tells us that God is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. You and I, we face junk. We, we, we find ourselves in little stories, but they're part of a bigger one. And God has told us he's working everything together providentially. If we are Christ, he's working the story out for us. He's sparing no expense. He sent his son for us. His son died in order to seal this for us. So these promises are sure. He's our protector. We can trust him. Everything he has said towards us is yes and amen, right? No scheme, no strategy will thwart the plan of God that he's writing. In fact, every attack against us, just as Laban's against Jacob, actually resounded in the blessing of further blessing of Jacob, every attack against us is just heaping up more joy and more reward on the other side. If you're here and you're a Christian, It's simply because these promises are true. That's why they've proved true. We're going to end this way. Or we're going to respond in singing. Because a God who is this big is worthy of all of our praise.
This should blow our minds. It should baffle us, but it should cause us to sing. We're going we're gonna to respond. We respond to things like this through, through giving of our time and our talent and, and, and all that we have. And we, we respond through taking communion as well. We do this every week here, and this is open to every person here who would identify and call themselves a Christian. We come forward, we take the bread, we dip it into the wine or juice, we have them in different cups so you can heed your conscience. We dip this and we remember that this is the price Christ or God paid with his own son's body and blood to seal this story for us. And so every single one of us is coming in, we're all jacked up, broken sinners. You're coming in with stuff from the week. You're facing things. We get to come forward, we take this as a way of celebrating and, and, and kind of anchoring our trust back in the hope that God's working it all together for our good. And so I invite you to stand. You can, we'll have a couple up here in a moment. You can come when you're ready, take it back to your seats, take it whenever you want, do some business with the Spirit. And um, I'm going to pray and then we will respond in worship through song here. Father, I thank you uh, for big sections of text. I thank you that every dot, every tittle, every page displays your glory for us. It reminds us that you're the one writing the narratives of our lives. As the psalmist said, in your book were written every day, all of our days, when as yet there were none. And so we have this assurance that you were the great author of salvation, that you were the one who began humanity. You're the one who has a, a, an epic conclusion to this story of, of our lives. And so as we find ourselves in these moments right now, wherever we are, we pray that you would draw our eyes back up to the glorious truth that have been presented to us in this text. Our hope would be anchored back in Christ and the finished work of the cross. And it's in your great name, Jesus, that I pray. Amen. Come when you're ready.